Hi, everybody. This is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics. I'm here with Jeffrey Heinzel from Ascendo Immersive Audio. Thank you for having me, Matt. Yes. And uh, we're here at an event at uh, Trinov Audio's headquarters where they've launched their new experience center. This is something that gives dealers an opportunity potentially uh, to come in and experience Trinov's best products in an, in an actual proper environment set up well. And it, of course, has your products in here. The, you're, you're the star of the show, in a sense, in terms of the speakers. So you've got your whole lineup here, including your top of the line Black Swan speakers. Yes. Now, um, in addition to that, and I, you, you mentioned this actually in, a, in another interview we did, um, that I did a video recently on bass Correct. and bass levels. Yes. And I think you and I generally agree on bass levels in Absolutely. this regard. Absolutely, yes. Um, this, so this room has your subwoofers. I think everybody who watches my channel knows of your subwoofers. Some people think they're crazy, over the top, and excessive. Other people, you know, dream about these things. Mm -hmm. Some of them mm -hmm. even own them. So we have 821s in here. Correct. By most standards, that's a lot. We have four in the front, four in the back. On top of that, there's a 32-inch subwoofer Correct, that's yes. been wired into the system and, and set up for infrasonic purposes. Again, by most standards, that's way over the top. But in fact, it wasn't done just so that we could play ridiculously loud bass. You know, I know there's people who like that. But the system was well balanced. Adam Pels mm -hmm. did it. Mm -hmm. We actually complained. I think most people would have heard it and been like, no, no, the bass is fine or turn it up even more. But a couple of us were like, Adam, is the bass balanced right? It sounds a little hot. And he goes, no, it is a little hot. And he fixed it. Mm -hmm. And we continued listening afterwards. But this system has a massive amount of, of dynamic range, especially in, in the low frequencies. Yes. And I think that that is a hallmark of your approach to speakers. All of your speakers have very high dynamic range. In fact, you tend to compromise on your uh, screen channels and on your surround speakers base in favor of ensuring that there is enough dynamic range in the key area, that 80 hertz and above. Always, yes. And then you make up for that with your kick subwoofers, as you Correct. call them, yeah. which is everything from a 10 inch to a 21 inch. Correct, yes. And then mm -hmm. you've got your infrasonic line, which are high excursion and larger displacement. And mm -hmm. in your belief, which I don't totally disagree with, is that you really need larger subwoofers to be able to reproduce those infrasonics accurately. Mm -hmm. Some people take the approach of just a whole lot of subs, and, and certainly that can work. Other people take the approach of making them bigger. And uh, so you want to tell us a little bit about what kind of brought you into this idea of, you know, a 21 is just not enough. I need to make something bigger. Well, I mean, the the... the revealing or, or eye-opening, um, I think, event was um, CDI 2016. Okay. Where we went to CDI and we uh, brought uh, eight 15-inch subwoofers. At that time, you know, that was still considered, yeah, not, not shabby, you know. By today's standards for many, eight 15s would be quite good. Yeah. And so we tested, of course, the system in our much bigger room at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Germany, but that um, room had very thick walls and concrete walls and concrete floors and all that. And so we, we were extending well below 20 hertz in this room, you know, and then we came to Cydia and these walls are two inch walls basically with uh, probably four or five mil thick uh, plywood and okay. in between styrofoam, styrofoam, <laughs> and then outside a, another four or five mil thick basically wood. And, and for those who've never seen it, this was designed to create portable, easily to set up and knock down listening rooms on a, a expo floor. Correct. And there, it's exactly what you described. I mean, it is, you could not have a flimsier material. Yeah. So everybody has this problem. <clears throat> and so the problem was in these rooms, obviously, when we measured in, when, it, when we calibrated at CDR, that um, all the base below 30 hertz was gone. Just yeah. gone, you know? And we tried different arrangements, you know, all, of course, according to uh, Floyd Tool and Todd Welty, you know, and um, none of them really worked, you know? Yeah. So we were a little bit frustrated. So I came, I mean, the system sounded really, really good down to 30 hertz, but then below that, it was, was not what we basically knew from home. And... <clears throat> I said, well, I mean, next time when we go to see it, yeah, you know, I, I, I need to have that fixed, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I went and studied what, what could be done. And of course, you know, everybody knows that when you want to 
play one octave down, you need to quadruple your cone area or quadruple your excursion or, you know, uh, do even more than that, um, quadruple your power. Um, so that's exactly what we did. I tried a 24 inch because that was kind of mass producible. Then um, I was not completely happy and, and um, I started, you know, to research. And at that time, it was still really difficult to find, let's say, a <coughs> manufacturer of the 32 cones, voice calls, spiders, magnets, whatnot. And I mean, we're using um, an 11 inch uh, triple stack magnet on yeah. the 32. So, I mean, that's really that's big. big, you know. Yeah. Um, you actually had a very cool... I don't know if it was you or Todd who came up with this, but the voice coils, you put them, you nestled yes, all of correct. your voice coils in each other. And yeah. it was sculptural. I have to be honest with you. Yeah. Lit up correctly, I would stick that in my family room. Yeah, yeah. I took pictures and sent it to people and they were like, that's really cool. Where can I get that? And I'm yeah. like, it's just a display. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but it highlighted your focus on mm -hmm. the large motors that you're using. Correct, yes. And the very large coils that you're mm -hmm. using. I mean, mm -hmm. I, if I recall correctly, the one, was the largest one the one that's used in the 80 inch? Correct. It yes. looked like you could wear that as a belt. No, it, it was actually large. No, it was, I mean, it's a 21-inch voice coil, almost 22-inch voice coil. It's literally that size. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you can you can slide it over and, you know, use it as a hula hoop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? which is impressive. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, of course, that's really important for having good uh, cone control and enough power and force to move that cone in and out. Yep. And the thing that's interesting is you're, you're, even your giant diameter subwoofers have very high excursion. So they're yes. not just big; they are mm -hmm. capable of moving in and out. Absolutely, quite a bit. yes, and and have very low cues. So that means a very very high uh, electrical control from the motor. You know, we use um, in the fifty inch we use um, almost forty kilograms of neodymium. And I don't know if you know what neodymium costs, but that's very expensive. Yeah, absolute. I think for people who don't understand, so your products are not cheap, and I and I think that's okay. I mean. You, you can't, you, you do actually have some lesser price products that sure. are quite good for the sure. money, but sure. in general, your high-end products like that, some people find the prices to be unbelievable. I think it's important to understand that in many cases, products like that, first off, they can't be mass produced. No. So they're going to be hand-built. That increases costs substantially, sure. actually. Yeah. They are using more expensive materials, and I think sometimes people don't realize how much that matters. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're using 40 kilograms of neodymium, you're talking about the cost to produce that motor going up substantially over what's happening in a typical subwoofer, oh, sure. which probably has no, it's probably using a ceramic unit. Well, those. I mean, even if you use, I mean, there is near the new woofers out there, of course, but then you there use are. maybe <clears throat> like 500 grams or, or, you know, maybe if it's a really, really big motor, 800 grams of neodymium, you know? Right. And you're using <clears throat> substantially more than that. Yeah. So I think that that's something that, it, it, you need to understand basically why your products cost what they do. And uh, the other part of it too, which we've talked about is it's important to price products in a way that allows everybody involved to then provide the necessary services within the sales structure Correct. so that clients are getting what they want. So when somebody, it's actually, you know, doing a video on my channel, I can get more into the sales side of things mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, when a client comes to me and they want a complete system and it's part of the model that you and, and Todd, I think have put together with your products, mm -hmm. We, want, we don't want somebody to come in and say, I want a pair of black swans. We want somebody to come in and say, I want a really amazing system that's going to provide me with a you know, wonderful experience. And from that kind of a conversation, I'll usually try to get into some details. I, I have a client, actually, um, who I've had conversations like this. And to me, it highlights the importance of this. I asked him about his past systems, his past history. I also tried to understand better his passions. Mm -hmm. And he told me about some childhood memories, which are what led up to his adult passions for this. Those childhood memories told me then what kind of system he wants. Mm -hmm. Now, from there, I can start to understand not just are the black swans, for instance, the right speaker for him or not. I can also understand how to talk about them to him. Correct. Because otherwise, it's just an expensive toy. Mm -hmm. But that's not why you use it. You use it because it's a particularly good toy. Yeah. It's a very precise tool for reproducing sound. It's a scalpel. 
Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I need to be able to explain that to him in a way that he's going to understand because he doesn't care that it can do, let's say, 130 dB. He mm-hmm. doesn't care about its bandwidth. He doesn't care about no. its directivity index. I care about that, but mm-hmm. he doesn't. What he cares about is the experience he's going to get in a room. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that at least Todd has, has pushed on me when talking about your products is that when a client comes and says, can you give me prices on the Black Swan? Rather than just saying, here's the price, let me know if you're interested, try to have a conversation with him first. Understand what it is he wants, and then make sure that what he's getting is a whole experience. I mean, no customer asks you, okay, so what's the price of, let's say, the rod in my Ferrari? Yeah. That's the point. I mean, the Ferrari is the the product, and so is the experience of the home theater. I mean, the entire home theater. So... Normally, the customer is not interested in the single parts that go into it. I mean, he may be interested when he's a technical guy yeah. to know more about it, but that's not the first and the beginning of the conversation. That's the end of the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I agree. And I think one of the interesting things is that you've put your products together in such a way that you can put systems together to give people experiences mm-hmm. where you can stay within the line. One of the biggest things I hate is when I find a good product, but the overall line doesn't have, I call them problem solvers. They don't have the products I need to meet the client's needs. Mm -hmm. So yes, I have, I'm just gonna pick on the Black Swan again. I have the Black Swan, it's the perfect speaker for his LCRs. But for the sake of argument, let's say you didn't have surrounds, Mm -hmm. which are timbre matched to those speakers, have similar overall performance, Mm -hmm. and are sized and shaped in a way that I can use them as surrounds in the room. Mm -hmm. Mm Because if you don't have that, now I'm stuck in a situation where I have to decide do I want to use those because they're a great LCR speaker, but then use somebody else's speakers for the rest and try to make it work? The likelihood that's going to work is pretty low. Mm-hmm. So you've put together a line that's very complete, and it provides products at different ranges for different sized rooms, different needs, different performance levels that allow you to complete a system for a client that will give them that amazing experience at all those levels. Correct. And your subwoofer line, line, uh, lineup is actually similarly expansive, basically. I mean, you've got we talk about you have an 80 inch sub. I actually had a project. It was one of the, I think it was how I met Todd originally where we had heard about this 80 inch sub coming. It wasn't out yet. And I knew the project could support it budget wise and the room was large. So we thought we might be able to fit it. Mm-hmm. The logistics of doing that actually turned out to be insurmountable. Absolutely. And it's a common issue. So you offer other options, which are important. Yes. You've got the 80 if it'll fit, but for those of you out there who are saying I'm saving up my pennies for it, please understand Unless you want me to cut a hole in the side of your house and crane it in, it's going to be very difficult to fit it in most homes. And we're talking just the driver here. Yes. Um, the 50-inch actually is not that different. It's a very large subwoofer. It, it is, doesn't yeah. fit in most rooms. Mm-hmm. You're not going to carry that downstairs into your basement. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, there's been people who have bought them and have not been able to fit it in their house. Mm-hmm. So it's important. Like that, that subwoofer exists for a reason. And in ultimate performance systems, we find workarounds to make this happen. Correct, yeah. But for typical people, that's not going to work. But there's a solution. I can get 432s, for instance, Mm -hmm. and those are easier to fit in the room. It's like an argument. I can't fit the 32s. I can go to the 24 and just increase the quantity. Correct. So that you've got the products at different levels to be able to achieve the same performance just by combining them. Yeah, I think our line um, is extremely scalable. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say with that is you can combine a Black Swan system, let's say, with with a 10 inch uh, or or even a six and a half inch as a as a as a Dolby Atmos or or uh, Oro or whatever uh, ceiling speaker you know yeah. and uh, that scalability of the line and also these different price points that are really um, structured perfectly um, um, support um, an extreme flexible design uh, perspective you know for for designers that need solutions sure, right absolutely yeah well, I think we've we've got a good length video here mm-hmm. for the channel. So I want to thank you again for coming on the channel. And yes. hopefully we'll have many more in the future. Uh, Jeffrey is somebody who I respect greatly and enjoy working with. So I'm sure you'll hear more about him and see him again. So thanks again for watching my video. And until thank next you. time. Uh, well, I shouldn't say until next time. I should say there's going to be many, many more videos that we will do with technical discussions about why certain products are right for you. So thank you.